Mr. Barkin has served, has served in his role since 2018, and he is responsible for the bank's monetary policy. I probably should have took this off. That'll be better. Oh, much better. Yeah, it always sounds so muffled under there. All right. Um, so he's responsible for uh, the bank's monetary policy, uh, bank supervision and regulation, and the Fed's national IT organization, just to name a few of his responsibilities. Uh, in fact, Mr. Barkin oversees the entire 5th District, which includes six states, North Carolina being one of them. This is not a small, ugh, sorry, this is not a small feat. I couldn't even imagine having that job, like associate dean's bad enough. I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, prior to joining the Fed, Mr. Barkin was a senior partner and chief risk officer at McKinsey & Company, a worldwide management consulting firm, and he also served as CEO or CFO for that company. Uh, Mr. Barkin, thank you so much for taking your time being here with us today. We're really excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Um, and I'll turn things over to Dave McAvoy at this point. Well, thank you, Tracy. Um, reading the, uh, the script that was provided, we're going to give Mr. Barkin the floor to speak okay. for 10 or so minutes. And then many of you have submitted questions. And, uh, and we'll do a Q&A after that. Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. I particularly want to thank the students who came to the 9 o'clock session for not bailing and actually choosing to uh, come be with me. Um, you know, I thought I might just uh, speak for a few minutes on what's happening in the economy. Um, I actually think you know what's happening in the economy, so I'll be relatively brief on the big picture. And then I want to dig into something that's of particular interest to me and hopefully to you, which is what's happening in the jobs market. Um, that may be relevant to you. It's certainly relevant to us and what we do. Um, uh, and I really do look forward to any and all uh, questions, challenges, comments, uh, and input. Um, these are my thoughts and my thoughts only, uh, so don't attribute them to anybody else in the Federal Reserve System. They don't know what they're talking about anyway. No, I'm teasing. Um, but, but let me just start by saying uh, you do know what's happening in the economy, at least big picture. Uh, COVID is down and seems to be largely behind us, uh, at least for now. Um, demand, underlying demand is incredibly strong. And of course, that demand has been fueled by fiscal stimulus. And so $6 trillion has been put into the economy, actually $7 trillion now with the bill last week, maybe $9 trillion if this bill gets passed in the next uh, few weeks. And uh, that has helped households who have record levels of savings, uh, businesses who have extremely strong balance sheet, and they are spending. And so demand is very strong. That demand is so strong that it's outpaced supply, uh, particularly for goods. There's been a huge rotation of people buying goods, whether they be cars or boats or houses or RVs or golf clubs or... Uh, the like. And I mean, uh, manufacturers just can't keep up. Uh, the other place that's short is labor. Uh, we have uh, about 4.2 million fewer people working today than we did pre-COVID, and yet employers can't find anybody to do work. Um, there's 10.4 million unfilled jobs in the U.S. Uh, that's basically very close to an all-time uh, record. Now, when, uh, when product is unavailable, prices go up. When workers are unavailable, wages go up. And both of those things are happening. Um, uh, the CPI, uh, which is not our preferred index, but the CPI hit its highest level in the last 30 years uh, last week. The PCE, which is our preferred index, looks like it's going to be up around 4% year over year uh, when it gets reported next week. Wages are up about 4% uh, year over year. Now, all of this sounds traumatic. And in fact, consumer sentiment is at, its, at levels that you usually only see in a recession. But every business I talk to basically tells me this is their best year ever. It's just an interesting uh, dichotomy. In that context, the Fed has started the process of normalization. Uh, we announced after our last meeting that we would begin tapering the asset purchases we've been doing. Um, I should just say a second about monetary policy. Uh, it encourages us to not overreact to sudden shocks. You know, If you have a shock and you take rates up or you take rates down, uh, and then the shock's over and you take rates back down or up again. It just jerks the economy around. And so our theory is to try to be patient uh, through shocks. But as um, you know, Jay said at his last uh, press conference, patience doesn't mean you would hesitate if it became time uh, for us to, re to increase rates. Um, and I think it's prudent to start normalizing now so that if we do need to do something, uh, we'd be able to do it. I also think while we're uh, tapering our asset purchases, 
you have time to probe the key questions. And I think, of course, the key question is, is inflation going to stay elevated or is it going to come back down to normal uh, levels? And I think, in turn, central to that question is what happens in the jobs market. So let me talk about that. And I'm going to do this speech in three parts. I'm going to go back into history. I'm going to then talk about today. And then I'm going to talk about tomorrow. I do that so those of you who are bored can know where you are in the conversation and catch up. And also, you'll know when it's about to end. Um, So let me talk about history. Because I think businesses for the last 30 years have been living in a world where they actually had excess workers. Um, And that was because of demographics. The baby boomers entered the workforce. That was because women started to work in the workforce at scale. Immigration was high uh, by historic standards. Educational attainment went up, which meant more folks were ready for the workplace. Better health, so people could live and work longer. Um, And access to international labor pools, if the domestic labor pool wasn't enough. And so lots of offshoring to places like India and the Philippines and the like. And not surprisingly, if labor is long, businesses are going to react that way. Um, Things like uh, using part-timers. Things like outsourcing, things like temporary agencies, um, uh, higher attrition staffing models. 30 years ago, there was actually a conversation about whether it was a smart thing to do to lay people off because you never knew if you'd get them back. Well, you know, that changed and now businesses are more than happy to scale their workforces uh, up and down. Um, uh, Pensions 30 years ago were a big thing in most big companies. Now they've pretty much uh, gone away. healthcare benefits, all of these things, working conditions. Um, Businesses have had the opportunity, because they were long labor, to make a set of choices that were good for businesses and good for their investors. They might have even been good for some of the immigrants coming in the country and some entry workers, but they probably weren't as good uh, for the existing workforce. Now, if you go back, I've talked 30 years, go back 10 years. If you looked at the numbers 10 years ago, you would have thought this was all about to change. The baby boomers were starting to retire. Male labor force participation started to drop. And so a lot of people predicted that the labor markets would get tight even 10 years ago. Uh, But that didn't happen. In fact, uh, participation stayed very strong through the last upturn. And you could imagine why. I mean, some new jobs got created, gig economy jobs that maybe didn't require the same set of skills or full-time work. The Great Recession could have forced some near retirees to work a little bit longer. The length of the upturn might have brought some people in from the sidelines. Um, the rise of certificate programs could have made it uh, easier for people to get connected uh, to jobs. But regardless, through that last upturn, you know, we did not have uh, this issue, which is why having it now in the pandemic is such an interesting time. And I'll now turn to chapter two, which is today. So we're making progress. So we've gone through the pandemic. We've got a labor shortage Um, I I actually think that there's three segments of the labor market, each of which are different. So I'll start with skilled trades, you know, carpenters, plumbers, welders, but also truck drivers, nurses. These are jobs that don't require a four-year degree, but do require some sort of certification, some sort of licensing. Um, We were short in those segments before COVID, and now we're really short because COVID has really escalated demand in manufacturing and in construction and in nursing. And so Um, huge demand for these workers, not enough. The answer to it is you've got to build more supply. Oops, I think we're not going to drink the rest of that now. Um, (laughs) You've got to build more supply, and that takes time, and that takes people getting into places like community colleges, where incidentally enrollment is down 15%. So you've got a market where it's incredibly tight, and the real challenge is getting more supply, and it's hard to get that supply. Okay, then... There's a second segment. Let me call them frontline service workers, right? And you know who I'm talking about. It's restaurant workers. It's hotel workers. It's seasonal workers and, um, you know, at leisure destinations, all those things. Um, a bunch of those folks got laid off uh, back in March. And that wasn't a place where people got laid off all the time. And so after six months, they started getting called back. But a number of them had gone into new jobs, right? Maybe they'd gone and worked at an Amazon distribution center. A number of others didn't want to come back to work. Uh, Maybe the job didn't seem as stable as it used to. Uh, Maybe it's just not as attractive to be in a job where, you know, you have to wear a mask all day and uh, your customers are obnoxious, perhaps, and um, uh, you're on your feet. The schedule's not uh, very good. Uh, Maybe it was unemployment benefits uh, that were keeping people out or even not the benefits, but just the savings that people had uh, while they were out. But, you know, here's a place where demand is back up but people just can't find workers uh, in that segment. 
The third segment is the professional classes. Think finance and HR, those kind of folks. There are places where it's very tight. You know, technology would be an example. But a lot of these places have not yet really broken the tight curve. But there's a real risk they will because quits are starting to elevate. And I think for this population, as more people quit and you get a sense of what life's like on the outside, more people quits become contagious, uh, if you want to put it that way. And so I think that's a place that's at risk. But, you know, we'll see where we go. Regardless, if you go across the three segments, participation in the economy is just not where it was before. It was 63.3% in February 2020. It's 61.6% today. It was 61.6% in March. And so it's basically stayed flat over the last seven or eight months. And I mean, I was one of those people who thought in September we would see a bunch of people come back in the workforce. You know, the enhanced unemployment has expired. Uh, COVID, I thought, was going to be down. Schools were going to be open. But we didn't see it at all. And so we've got a situation where job growth is strong. It's coming out of unemployment. Unemployment's dropping at record rates, right? Unemployment in this community is actually well below uh, the national average. It's dropped at record rates. But the real issue is people out of the workforce. And so wages are going up because employers are bidding against each other for one another's workers rather than raising wages and bringing more people in the workforce. That's the situation we've got today. And that, of course, leads us to the question of where are we going tomorrow, right? Um, and I think you, you have to ask yourself, was the aberration... Is the aberration today, you know, these last four or five million people who are not in the workforce, or was the aberration two years ago where they were actually working and now they've come up with a different, uh, you know, point of view? And, you know, there are lots of reasons you might think that. I mean, the labor force is going to continue to shrink. Fertility is down. Uh, That's obviously not changing anytime soon. Demographics are aging, right? Immigration is not turning around. Visas are down 700,000 versus two years ago. Uh, offshoring seems a little bit less attractive today when people start thinking about country risk. Uh, retirements are up. We're at about a million and a half or two million more retirements than you would have expected over the last 18 months. And again, you can think about why. Uh, maybe 401ks uh, had increased, but you know, maybe you're talking about a, a group that's got severe fear of COVID because they were most likely to be affected. Maybe they're taking care of their grandkids right? Uh, Maybe they're not that comfortable with remote technology, but retirements are up. And traditionally, they don't come back quickly. And then you could talk about, uh, you know, women's participation in the workplace. uh, And that's most pronounced on working class women with small kids. And again, it's easy to articulate why that's the case, whatever combination of schools being unreliable, uh, daycare, childcare being unaffordable, uh, the role in care and your undesire to get others in your family, uh, sick. Um, and it has been two years after all of COVID. I think it's a thing people don't really uh, emphasize enough, which is we've been in this for two years. And so it must be the case that there are changes that are going to last well belong, well longer than a month or two. And I think you're probably seeing some of that. Uh, this is all going to matter because I think this excess demand is going to last. In addition to everything I've talked about before, we just passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. They're talking about a $1.8 trillion um, uh, additional stimulus bill. You've got uh, 2.7 trillion in excess savings in people's pockets, and so you know I think it's highly likely you're going to have elevated demand for labor at a time where participation is going to come back slowly. Um, so, what are businesses going to do? Uh, I think some of what they're going to do is actually going to be good for the workforce. Um, you know, I talked to a, a chicken processor that is uh, has dropped drug tests and background checks. Turns out, you know, their risk when you bring somebody into a chicken processor is not actually that high. You can only carry out so many chickens. Um, uh, I, I talked to a, uh, uh, a tool distributor that's introduced a soft skill training program. So they hire people who aren't ready for the workplace. They invest in four to six weeks of training them to be ready in the workplace so that they can hire them. Um, you know, I've talked to a steel company that's hiring full-time recruiters because we know we need to get people. We're going to search... Uh, even harder. Um, I hear about people redesigning jobs, rethinking schedules, uh, raising pay, obviously, raising benefits. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the old company towns that used to exist in a lot of places where uh, the, the company knew to get workers, it had to invest in housing and amenities in the local community. And we may well be working back toward that place. I mean, just look at some of the housing challenges, uh, you know, we have in this community. 
some of the business reactions are going to be less good for labor. I had a, I had a conversation with a head of a major fast food chain who described very quickly how they're going to go from 11 workers per store to five workers per store through whatever combination of automation and robotics. It turns out that robots can actually make French fries. Um, if you've stayed in a hotel lately, you know they're not cleaning the rooms as often. You know, that's going to be negative for housekeepers. If you've gone to a grocery store lately, you realize that self-checkout has really expanded. That's not going to be as good for, for checkout clerks. If prices continue to rise, then demand will drop. That won't be good for jobs uh, either. And I, I just want to say all of this risks being particularly threatening to the last people into the workforce, right? Um, the hurdle to get in is going to get higher, right, as wages and automation and robotics, you know, go up. And so that is a place you know, I worry. Now, uh, there's some interesting examples of how to tackle this from other countries. Um, in Canada, uh, our workforce participation of women compared to Canada was the same in 1999. They're now seven points ahead of us. And the things they're doing are not surprising. It's childcare, it's parental leave, it's flexibility programs. Um, we actually had age 60 to 64, our participation was four points higher than Japan 20 years ago. Now they're 15 points ahead of us. And they're doing things like creating incentives for employers to hire older people, uh, you know, changing working conditions and schedules to be more uh, uh, familiar, having a healthier uh, senior workforce. So there's a set of things that uh, countries can do. And you could imagine a set of things we could do in this country, which, of course, would start, number one, with getting COVID behind us. I mean, that's absolutely uh, critical. All of these people who are hesitant because they're worried about getting sick or their families getting sick or killing their you know, grandparents, you know, I think that's a huge issue. Uh, legal immigration, that's another uh, issue to bring more workers into the economy. Investing further in education and job training, particularly, as I said, at a time where enrollment's down in these community colleges. Investing in rehabilitation and getting more people ready for the workplace. Reimagining childcare in elder care, two industries that are really critical to participation but have absolutely struggled uh, in this downturn, and thinking hard about uh, social benefit and tax policy changes that best balance you know, what we're going to do. And I should talk about that. Someone's going to ask me about the stimulus program. Uh, the NBER did a working paper a couple weeks ago that took this child tax credit apart. And it was interesting. It's just a model. I don't know whether it's accurate or not. But it it models that this tax credit is going to reduce child poverty 34%, which is an incredibly impressive number and a really important thing for us to do in this economy. It also suggests we're going to, it will reduce participation by a million and a half. That's a bit of a challenge given what I just talked about. And uh, you know, similarly, uh, universal pre-K, Fed has done a lot of work on pre-K over the years. It's incredibly important to create uh, kids who can become adults or productive in society. Um, but that's going to put a, little pr- a lot of pressure on uh, uh, child care providers. And you're probably going to have increased costs and therefore increased prices in the rest of the child care system. And how does that net out in terms of participation? And so all these things, the devil's in the details. But when you get into it, it's kind of worth uh, you know, thinking hard about. Because I do think uh, for us as businesses, as us as uh, government entities, we're going to have to think hard about how we navigate this situation. So to sum it all up... Uh, you know, COVID has made businesses, COVID has made governments, and COVID has made even economists rethink their views on the labor market. Uh, increasingly, the data suggests that we may be moving from a period where labor was long to one where labor is short. Um, that situation can be managed, and other countries have shown us the way, but it's going to require a real intentionality. And so with that, maybe I'll have a seat, see if my Diet Mountain Dew has in any way <laughs> settled. Take the risk. And get to questions. As you know, prior to today's events, we asked our attendees to, to submit questions they had for you. We have uh, a number of them. I should say that uh, Mr. Bark has to depart promptly um, to, to catch a flight in Charlotte. So we will, I will hopefully be, be monitoring the clock. Um, so let's, let's start in. The, the first question, um, how are current supply chain issues affecting the NC 5th District differently than other areas in the U.S.? Uh, well, uh, the 5th District, um, which my, that's my district, which is, you said the NC 5th District? You mean North Carolina or you mean my entire district? This, let's go with your entire district. Um, so my entire district is Maryland, West Virginia, down to South Carolina. Um, and so 
these supply chain issues really aren't hitting Washington D.C. very much because that's a government thing, and you know, supply is, is uh, people. Um, uh, it is uh, hitting manufacturers. And so we have a lot of manufacturers in our district in Southern Virginia. Hickory would be a great example of a manufacturing town. And if you're in the furniture business in Hickory, you can't believe how good a year you've been having. You know, people were stuck in their homes. They decided they needed new furniture. They went and ordered new furniture. Um, you can't get it from overseas because the boats won't arrive. And so domestic furniture manufacturer, this is as good as it has been in anyone's memory. But the problem is now getting supply. And, and uh, same in South Carolina where... Um, the automotive manufacturers are struggling to get chips and Boeing, of course, same kind of thing. And so I just say the manufacturing community, which is very heavy in our district, is really uh, is really struggling to get supply. That that's the big uh, that's the big issue. So, so you know, actually, I'm going to kind of skip to the next question because you, you kind of covered it. But this the question is, how do you see a hopeful increase in labor? And you kind of mentioned that you don't see a hopeful increase in 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 labor. Um, but how do you see this hopeful increase in, in labor uh, helping supply chain shortages companies are currently facing? So another way to think about this is how do they get to the other side of this? Yeah, well, look, I think participation in the workforce is going to creep up. Right. I don't think it's going to blow out as right. I kind of hoped it would in September, but I think it's going to creep up. And as I said, the single biggest thing that would help with getting this stupid virus uh, behind us. I mean, that would be the, that would be the key to it. Um, uh, it is absolutely the case that a lot of manufacturers are struggling to uh, meet demand because of labor shortages. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, everything you read is about, you know, boats outside of Long Beach Harbor, but labor shortages are a big deal. And if you can't count on your labor force to come to the um, uh, to your production plant, it's actually pretty hard to get uh, manufacturing out. So, um, you know, everything does come to equilibrium in time. Um, economists like to say prices are the solution to uh, these kind of things. And so as wages go up, we will attract more people in the workforce. As uh, prices go up, demand will moderate. And, and that's how it's going to settle. But I do think it's going to take longer than just a couple months. I think we'll be dealing with well into this coming year. Um, so related to that, with all the help wanted signs everywhere, I mean, everyone sees this in their, in their everyday course of life. Um, what do you think will help motivate workers to start working again? Well, I, I want to start by saying I think most workers are motivated to work. Right. So I, I don't see this as some, uh, I don't know, a government benefits issue that has people you know, on the sideline. I don't see it as a malaise where people don't want to work and they just want to you know, play video games all day or something. I don't, I don't think that's it at all. I think that um, uh, there is a legitimate set of fears out there about... Um, uh, the virus. And we all, even those of us in the room, will have a broad range of how seriously we take it. But, you know, when I talk to people who are uh, taking care of their grandparents, you know, I hear a lot more concern than I hear with people who are, you know, forgive me, living in a fraternity house. I mean, it's just, it's a different uh, group. And so um, I, I just think uh, we've got to get that. That's the single most thing we could do. By the way, when I talked about the retirees earlier, some are worried about their health. Some have a spouse or a a kid who's got comorbidities and they're worried about them. Um, but I actually increasingly am hearing about people taking care of grandkids. Right. You know, the reason they're not in the workforce is that their son or daughter works and they need to take care of the kids because no one, no one else can. And so I think if we could break to the other side of this thing, that's a huge, uh, you know, positive on the labor force. Um, and then I've talked about a bunch of things that businesses are going to have to do uh, and, uh, and governments may choose to do. Uh, to complete the rest of it. So do you think there is some as, you know, aspect of truth to people kind of reflecting on their lives, looking at the jobs that may not, they may not want to be in or at their, the, 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 ch- the chicken processing plant is a good example of like, yeah. do, do you think there's, there's some truth to, to that, that that's a sizable fraction of people who aren't? It's been two years. Yeah. So I think a lot of people working are you know, thinking about their lives and trying to wonder what they do. But importantly... I think the workforce has more say today than it did two years ago. That's the underpinning of uh, the talk I was just giving. And, and uh, you know, think about it this way. Um, because of the fiscal stimulus, the stimulus checks, the unemployment insurance, uh, the child tax credit, but also because uh, most of us did not spend as much money 
in the 12 months after March of 2020 than we did before. People have a lot of money in their pockets. The number's 2.7 uh, trillion overall. That's true, even the bottom income quartile has 150 billion more in their pockets than they did beforehand. And that doesn't include, you know, uh, if their student loans got repaid or their um, rent didn't get paid. So there is a lot of money and that gives people the ability to be choosy. So it's a hot, hot labor market. Um, let's say I worked at McDonald's and I made $11 an hour. Um, and I'm reading all this stuff about Amazon and Walmart and $15 an hour, $17 an hour. I don't think I would just go back to my $11 an hour job. I think I would go look for a $15 or $17 job. And as an economist, I go, good for them. Right. I mean, it's the market working. And if there's more demand for people at 17, then that's how the market's going to clear. But I, I think there's an adjustment factor. I think there's an adjustment for the individuals who you know, know they could go back to McDonald's, have some money in their pocket to pave a path to hopefully get to Amazon. And there's adjustment for companies that are used to paying 11 and really don't want to pay 15 mm -hmm. and are going to try everything they can to avoid increasing their cost structure. And so I think what we're seeing on the labor market is just an adjustment process. And that adjustment process is being financed, if you will, by the fact that there is money in people's pockets that enables them to be choosy. Mm -hmm. So, so what factors does the Fed think contribute to the nearly 11 million unfulfilled, unfilled rather, jobs in the U.S.? Well, I, I talked a bunch about some of the things that drive uh, labor shortages. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about what's happening on the business side, uh, which is, and it doesn't get talked about much, but uh, uh, the most popular program that was passed last year was the PPP program, which was basically funding for small businesses to get through this crisis. Now, if we'd had the crisis and we hadn't had the PPP program, a lot of them would have gone out of business, right? But what happened today, good for them, good for us, I think, is they didn't go out of business. But now all these restaurants that didn't go out of business are also trying to hire in a way that you wouldn't before. So I think the demand for people, this is part of the design of the PPP program. It's not, it's not an accident, but it's kept people in business who otherwise would have been out, which means it's elevated demand for workers, right? I think the surprise was less that and the surprise was more that people didn't come back faster, but you've also got elevated demand. That's the other big part that's happening. Um, all right. So let's move on to the next one. Current. All right. So current technology has made it easier than ever to start a small business. Many people found themselves with an excess of time and savings you mentioned the 2.7 trillion during the pandemic. Given the current labor shortage and continued decline in college enrollment, is it possible that the pandemic created a non, this is your favorite word, non-transitory, temporary, or non-temporary yeah. uh, flight to self-employment gig work? Um, so there's a lot in that question. Yeah. This, um, this, you know, pick what you, pick yeah. whatever nugget. Well, Interesting fact, um, small businesses have started, uh, small business startups declined each and every year for the last 15 years until last year. And they really have exploded. And so you do have a lot of people starting businesses. And that may be part of why you've got people not in the workforce. They're starting their own business. Um, you know, fact two that's in there, you know, gig economy does give an opportunity for people, um, you know, to work that's different than the way it used to work. And you know, I'm told by people who are in these hiring markets all the time that, you know, Tom, the way you think about work, which is that I live to work. I mean, I love what I do. I love what I used to do. I am thinking about it constantly. That There's a whole huge part that sort of works to live. And so they need to have this much money to live. And once they get to that amount of money, they're not worried about working harder, or getting more. They actually, the way the economists would say, they value leisure time over, uh, over the money. And so, um, I think it is interesting to think about how the gig economy options, think driving an Uber or a Lyft, allow a bunch of people who weren't that far away from where they needed to get financially to get there without working full time. Now, we count those people in the labor force, mm -hmm. so it's not, it doesn't affect our stats, but I think it probably has affected the number of people who are available for restaurants and hotels and theme parks uh, to work. I think it has. So, so part of this question was, was um, a statement of decreasing college enrollment and part of that we know is, is, is demographics. But, you know, presumably when, when you, you know, the, the economy or at least demand so strong right now, there are aspects of the economy that are strong. And, the, you know, the, the flip side of that 
is when you're in a recession, that's when a lot of students may go to grad school or may, you know, the mm-hmm. opportunity cost is lower. Is, do, do we see that during the pandemic, apart from what the, the pressure that demographics are, are pushing on it, that the pandemic has caused a decrease in enrollment in college? Is that, is that true? Um, four-year colleges are actually doing fine. Right. Uh, two-year colleges are really getting killed. Um, and I was in Lynchburg uh, at one of the community colleges about three weeks, four weeks ago. And I was talking to a bunch of students because I was trying to figure this out. And 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 what they said, which uh, both makes sense to me and you can find some evidence in the data is, you know, there's a big difference between graduating from high school and going into a $10 an hour job and graduating going into an $18 an hour job. And then a bunch of people who aren't that college inclined are saying, hey, I can make, I don't know, $36,000 a year. You know, I'm going to live large as an 18 or 19 year old doing that. And maybe I'll go to school later. And the case that they were making to me with their friends is they're making a different short term, long term trade off. You know, for those of you who are here, you know, it is a fact. College graduation, not college attendance, college graduation uh, is uh, strongly correlated with um, better life outcomes on any dimension. Health, wealth, uh, how long you're going to live, um, resilience in a downturn, income. Any measure is, and so it's a long-term investment you guys are making. Hopefully you're having fun while you're doing it, but um, it's a real investment. There's a set of people not making that investment. And so I think, if you will, short-term, that's okay for a certain set of employers who need people to work, but I don't think it's going to be good for society. So this question, and and maybe it's true, we'll find out. Uh, Do you believe that, that the people leveraging themselves out of the labor market uh, you know, strategically, I guess, for, for higher pay will, will receive what they're looking for. So I guess the assumption is that that's happening. So, you know, I'm a fuddy-duddy. Uh, I think higher pay is good. Uh, I don't think uh, higher pay is the same as job satisfaction. Right. I must say that because I work for the Federal Reserve, and trust <laughs> me, I took a pay cut. Um, the... Uh, uh, and so I think um, I think this is a market where if you want higher pay, you can get it. Um, but I am reminded of the market of the late 90s, which was the dot-com era, and a bunch of people who thought, I'm going to go make my fortune in you know shoes.com, and shoes.com kind of blew up, and they sort of lost four or five years of their career. And I'm just a big believer in uh, trying to figure out what you want to do and doing it. And it might pay a lot, or it might pay a good amount, or it might pay a little, and you can kind of you know make that work. But I, I think actualization comes back to job satisfaction. And every study I've ever seen says, uh, do you trust your boss? Do you trust your institution? Do they treat you as an individual, you know, as opposed to how much money I make? Yeah, and, and, and potentially, you know, with all the working from home during the pandemic, that might kind of be non-transitory. And, and so yeah. some of that flexibility could help, right? Well, I think uh, you can't do this for two years and then say, oh, no, we can't make it work yeah. You know, from home. I mean, whoever's worked from home knows they have the option right. of working from home. But I do think um, the market hasn't really spoken on how people are going to work. And what I mean by that is there's going to be two accounting firms out there. One of them lets everybody work from home. One of them forces everyone to be in the office. One of them has less money they spend on real estate. One of them has more investment, presumably, in collaboration and culture One of them attracts talent in one way. One of them attracts a different set of talent. And they're going to go out in the marketplace. They're going to compete. And I don't actually know who's going to win, but somebody's going to win. And so five years from now, we're all going to go, ah, you know, that's the better model for accounting. Mm -hmm. You can actually lower your price because you don't have real estate costs. And you can do every bit as well in terms of all the collaboration and culture and the like. Similarly, you know, two of you are going to graduate. And one of you is going to insist on being in person at an accounting firm, let's say, and one of you is going to insist on being remote at an accounting firm, and your careers will also develop. And I don't know how that one's going to play out. You know, one of you, I believe, will have better access to relationships and network and uh, will show up at work and your boss will notice you and remember that for a, a promotion. And, you know, one of you will have a better, uh, will have a lower commute, and less commuting costs. I, I don't know how that's going to play out. But I do know that five years from now, we'll know which one of you seems to be winning. <laughs> their career fight. And and again, that's, it's just the marketplace is going to work. And this is not the real marketplace. Like we've all been constrained by COVID. People have had to, you know, uh, grimace and make it work, whether that be, you really wanted to be in the workforce or you really didn't, whether you really wanted to send all your workers home or you didn't, 
it's going to take some time to, to sort, but it will sort and then we'll have a better sense of what happens. I do have a point of view on the last one. I just want to say it. Um, I think I said it earlier today too, which is if you're going to work fully remote, you just have to recognize you are competing against people globally. You're not just competing against people locally. Because if I can send you know the work to Boone, I can send the work to the Philippines. So I have to follow up on that then as an educator. Um, with all the, the, you know, in the last two years, quite a bit of teaching online. Do you have any, you know, thoughts on future role of higher ed and in, in, in managing that? Uh, I mean, I think you can teach online. I think all the evidence shows that there are some set of kids who uh, are able to learn at the same level and some set of kids who aren't. Yeah. And so I think there's a risk of leaving some people, uh, you know, behind mm-hmm. uh, when you do that. Um, I also think, you know, the value proposition of college is so much more, no offense intended, <laughs> than the teaching. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't think four-year schools have much of a strategy if the strategy is, in fact, all remote. Right, right. I have a daughter who's a senior, so I have some live experience in this. Um so I, I think that what colleges are doing are, uh, I used to tease my kids and say, it's like, uh, you know, you're in prison for 18 years and this is like a halfway house on your way to being a free person. Um, uh, but, you know, your RAs might be your parole officers. I mean, there's some comparisons. Um, and, and so I, I would just, uh, I think that the colleges have evolved to give a very compelling four-year offer which does have an educational component, but it's not limited to the educational component. And so I think if you actually tried to run Western Governors or University of Phoenix, you would end up with a very different product, importantly, at an extremely different price point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely the case. Um, All right, next up. So how do you see the labor conditions coming out of the holiday season? You've you've alluded to the time frame you have in your mind, but do you believe the, the labor market will show a strong rebound going into the spring and early summer of next year? Uh, it's, it's hard to know what to believe now, right. but that is the next window I'm looking at. Um, you know, I'm very much focused on what are we going to see at the end of January across all of these metrics, because I do believe that some of the supply chain issues we've had have been uh, decisions by retailers to stockpile. Uh, in advance of Christmas. And so demand has been greater than it might otherwise be. If you looked at the earnings reports this week, you know, Walmart's inventories are up 11% year over year. Um, People are ordering in advance. And so I'm wondering whether after Christmas this will relax and some some of the pressure on supply chain will ease. Similarly, um, uh, you know, I'm wondering on the labor force, these people who do have money in their pockets and are waiting to see when the job markets open, whether that money will have run out enough that post Christmas they'll go, okay, now it's time to get into the workforce. So I think that's another potential thing. And then, um, you know, I said at the beginning, COVID's on the decline, at least for now. I mean, it feels pretty good today. It did not feel good two weeks ago. And if you look at Germany, Germany is at like all kind of all time highs in terms of case count. So are we going to have another wave roll through here in December and January, like we did last year? If we don't, then I think that's going to also create a real tailwind into the economy. So I, I think, I think it's very useful to think about the end of January as the next important marker mm-hmm. in my mind, but I don't know what I'm going to learn. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to learn. All right. So in 2020, the, uh, and we could add 21 in here, the shortage of labor saw a dramatic rise in wages. However, as 21 unfolds, we have see, also seen a dramatic rise in inflation, dramatic, of course, could be subjective, but rise, you know, inflation for goods and services, offsetting, uh, potentially offsetting the gains in wages made by labor supplies workers last year. That said, labor supply remains short. So is it possible wages might continue to rise in the next few years? And if so, what do you think the implications, the consequences are? Positive, negative, neutral? Well, um, so what we all worry about uh, when we think about inflation, which is an important part of our mandate, is the continuous spiral where prices are up, so you demand higher wages. Wages are up, so people raise prices. 
prices are up so you demand wages. And that's a lot of what happened in the 70s, you know, this ever competition between wages and prices. If you go back just two years, no one thought there really was any inflation. And so wages kind of went up 2 to 3% a year, and that was more than inflation, and everyone was happy. And I think it's better for businesses and, frankly, better for the economy to have stability and predictability. And what you're asking, of course, is right, which is it's really hard to know right now you know, what's going to happen. As I suggested earlier, I do think once we get past the supply chain stuff, prices are going to revert and they're going to moderate. I think uh, you know, businesses will do what they're going to do. The labor will do what it's going to do. I think wages will be tighter than they've been historically, but won't be out of control. And I think we'll revert back to a place where real wages, you know, uh, nominal versus inflation, are increasing at a moderate rate, like they have for the last 10 years. That's my base case. But lots of stuff could happen. Um, you know, and in particular, I worry about shocks. You know, I worry about China doing something with Taiwan that makes us have to react in some way. And so that what's really the low cost manufacturer in the U.S., China, all of a sudden goes off the grid. You know, I, I worry about, uh, you know, the impact uh, of the unintended impact of certain governmental programs that might or might not cause this kind of increase. There's a lot to worry about. We're just going to have to see. And so, so related to that with, with, with the stimulus, and you did mention that. I mean, do you, do you see that as, you know, part, part of um, the cause of in, inflation? Well, uh, there have been a lot of different stimuluses. Yeah. So uh, you have to be a little more specific, which is last year we went into the deepest valley any of us could remember. Unemployment was as high as it's been in my lifetime. And the notion of passing $2 trillion of stimulus to get individuals and businesses through that ditch, I think – was not inflationary Mm -hmm. and I think clearly uh, needed. Um, We then had a second set of stimulus programs, and that was one in March and one in May. We had a second set of stimulus programs in December and March of this year. Um, uh, You know, I can't blame the legislatures for when they were passed because it was before cases were high, unemployment was high. You didn't know that the vaccines would be as effective as they would. But with 2020 hindsight, I think it created limitations in the labor market and it accelerated demand in the goods market. And so, um, you know, would we have somewhat less inflation? Probably. Right. Now you've got two other ones coming right now. You've got an infrastructure bill and you've got a build back better plan. Um, uh, We'll see what's in the build back better plan. The infrastructure bill, it's over 10 years. So Mm -hmm. I don't think it's got a real inflationary impact other than we don't have enough infrastructure workers now. And so we are going to have to solve this problem I talked about earlier of infrastructure workers. Um, the Build Back Better plan, at least as conditionally structured, it may or may not get passed by the House, then it will get adjusted in the Senate. It appears to pay for the stuff it does. So I think top line, if it pays for it, you know, it won't be top line inflationary, at least at, at scale. So then you have to dig deeper, as I said in my talk, into what are the mechanics of some of the things that are in it? And will it reinforce some of these labor market shortages uh, or not? So, so the next question, I'm going to read, even though you likely already covered it, but uh, it says transitory, so uh, I'm going to do it again. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues add, said you have to have a swear jar for every time you use that <laughs> word. <laughs> there, and this isn't the last time. Okay. So do you believe that inflation numbers are truly transitory? <laughs> we can move on. I'm just giving you the, no, no, the look, opportunity. Um, I said this earlier, so I apologize for those who came to the earlier thing. If you go to June of this year, of inflation was new cars and used cars. Yes, that was just chips. And uh, hotels, rental cars, and airline tickets coming back closer to normal levels from their depressed levels of a year ago. That was temporary inflation, and no doubt in my mind. By the way, I've said earlier, so I'll just read. I don't like the word transitory because to you and me, it means temporary. But to economists, it means it'll all pass eventually. And the difference between temporary and eventually can be a pretty big difference. And so I, I just don't I just don't use that. That's why I have the swear jar. Um, uh, when you look at inflation now, it does seem more broad based. So some of that stuff is still there. New and used cars continue to escalate uh, in prices. Uh, travel's actually you know coming back the other way. And some other things are starting to increase, like rents. And you could imagine why rents would be increasing with housing prices so elevated. But they're starting to increase. But and history says that tends to be a little longer lasting. So I'm now a little bit you know, more focused on whether a broader based inflation means it's likely to have more um, sustained effect. 
And that suggests to me that it's time that the Fed start the process of normalizing policy because of that. Those are all very much interlinked. Mm-hmm. And I guess related to that, then, will, will filling job openings only become harder once interest rates begin to rise? Probably goes the other way, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if interest rates rise, that should be some dampener on the interest-sensitive sectors like housing mm-hmm. that presumably will, you know, say there's less construction jobs being required. And so same number of workers, fewer jobs. So I think it's likely to go the other way. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. What's, what is your opinion on the short and long-term effects of the proposed unrealized capital ta- uh, gains tax? I want to say, first of all, how impressed I am that students here are interested in the unrealized capital gains tax. (laughs) I don't know what you've been doing during your four years, but good on you. (laughs) Uh, I I don't think it's actually in the bill. So I I think it's sort of a theoretical uh, uh, question. Um, I I think there are real uh, challenges of funding the economy we've set up for ourselves, Um, you know, not the least of which is Social Security and Medicare which, you know, are commitments we've made to our seniors and they're not getting cheaper and we don't have any additional funding for them. And uh, and we don't yet have a spending and revenue formula that makes any sense. The debt of this country has gone from 38% of GDP in 2007 to a little over 100% of GDP today. Uh, The highest it's ever been was World War II. At the end, it was 106%. So without fighting that war, you know, we're now there. And so... There needs to be a thoughtful conversation about um, what's an appropriate level of spending and uh, what's an appropriate methodology of funding. And uh, there seems to be zero alignment on what the appropriate uh, methodology of funding would be. Uh, But that's what this is all, you know, part of the debate. I don't honestly think that um, you're going to solve our funding problems by taking a few billionaires and taxing them. But, you know, uh, taxing wealthier people is, in fact, one of the likely funding methods. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're just going to have to figure out how they, uh, how they land that. I don't think we have, we have some time for a few more. The, uh, so with inflation expectation, expectations surging uh, and the Fed beginning to taper asset purchases, what is your outlook on the strength of the U.S. The US economy in the next couple of years? Or actually, I'm sorry, this is on the U.S. dollar, on the U.S. dollar. Well, uh, let's see. Um, the U.S. economy, as I've described, underlying demand is incredibly strong. Um, uh, I would not actually say inflation expectations are spiking other than short term. Uh, we look very hard at medium term inflation expectations. And whether it's survey based or market based, they look to be relatively stable. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Um, uh, you know, the U.S. is in competition with other countries and so when you think about what happens to the dollar, you have to think about what's happening to other countries. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that the recovery in this country is faster than that of other countries, uh, which means that you would expect the dollar to be stronger than other countries. It seems clear to me that uh, uh, the forward momentum of the U.S. economy is strong enough to be able to handle a higher level of interest rates than most other countries, which means you'd expect the dollar to be stronger than uh, other countries. Um, and, uh, and that's probably as far as I'm going to go on. It's, that's not investment advice because that just means we have a stronger dollar than they do. It doesn't mean directionality over the next three, six, nine or, or 24 months. Um, but I mean, coming out of the great recession, we saw this, I mean, the European economy is just not as strong as ours is. Mm -hmm. And so that does support a strong dollar. All right. So does the 10 year treasury bond rate suggest that the financial markets agree with Chairman Powell that inflation factors are transitory. Um, so for those of you who aren't following it every day, uh, a 10-year Treasury bond uh, is about 160 basis points, 1.6%. And if you believe that we're going to have 5% inflation for the next 10 years, you should not buy a 1.6% uh, Treasury bond. So at some level, yes. Um, it does suggest that they... Uh, agree with the chairman. Um, I have to say, I don't take much signal from 10-year treasury bonds. And the reason I don't is that if you have savings that you want to keep safe anywhere in the world, your best bet is the 10-year treasury. It is liquid, so you know you can get out of it whenever you need to. It is stable. 
The U.S. is a stable economy. We have a rule of law here. Uh, regardless of what you think of inflation this week, inflation over the last 30 years has been very moderate. And so I just think that, that and, you know, it's not like the euro. Who knows if that's even going to stay together? Um, it's not like China, where who knows about the rule of law? It's not like the yen, where the economy is not very good. It's not like the Swiss franc, where the float's not very aggressive. So I just think the 10 year treasury is driven more by the rest of the world's comparison of investing here versus other places. Um, some of the big investors in the 10-year treasury, the Japanese, their 10-year b- bill is negative 50 basis points. So right now you've got a 210 basis point spread in exchange for taking some currency risk. And I just told you, I think the US dollar is pretty strong. That's why the rate's so low. That's how people are making the investment. And so you know, I, I think any bond price is just supply and demand as opposed to, I believe, Chairman Powell or not. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's Yes, that's what it would suggest, but I just wouldn't make too much of it. Mm-hmm. All right, let's do let's do one more. Okay, in the, in the courtesy of your time, um, and this is kind of broad, so I, I like this. What long term effects do you anticipate because of the COVID nineteen pandemic? Uh, well, um, for sure, how people think about work is changing. Um, you know, one's ability to be flexible. When I showed up at the Fed, no one would do a phone call with me. I'd been flexible my whole life. I'd been on and off side because it wasn't a real meeting unless you were in person uh, or at least on a video. And so now, you know, you've got that flexibility. So I think how people think about where they work is absolutely uh, changed. I think the notion of a pandemic has been in books for years, has been in uh, scenario planning for years. But honestly, nobody really took it seriously. It's like cyber. Everybody is cyber, you know, but no one's ever had a cyber attack. And when you have one, it's tough. So this is now crystallized, which means I think for the next 30, 40, 50 years, this notion of how one handles a pandemic will be front and center and people will be more uh, prepared for that. Uh, I think downtown real estate is going to change in a lot of places. I think supply chains are going to change. You saw Ford today, you know, buying into a chip manufacturer. I think all these companies that thought we could just send stuff overseas and don't worry, the boat will get here and with plenty of room in the port, they're going to rethink that. I think what you own versus what you outsource is going to change when people found themselves dependent on a bunch of uh, suppliers. I think the amount of inventories people choose to hold is going to change. So I think there's pretty significant differences to how businesses operate and how we work. And I, you know, like I said, I thought a lot of the stimulus last year was needed, but I think at some point here, uh, our government's going to say, holy cow, you know, we've got a debt challenge mm-hmm. and some of that is going to end up changing as well. Excellent. Good. Tom, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Um, I think I can speak for everyone that we've, we've learned a lot. I certainly have learned a lot uh, and it's been excellent. I know you've got a flight and so... And it's a little bit of adventure to get the airport from Boone. Awesome. Um, And again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Let's give uh, Mr. Barkin a round of applause. (laughs)